Hello and welcome to the Point of Care Podcast. Today's topic is acute kidney injury in the inpatient setting. As an introduction, an AKI is defined by a rise in serum creatinine of greater than 0.3 over 48 hours or above 1.5 times baseline over one week or urine output less than 0.5 cc's per kilogram per hour over six hours. GFR is not used to measure the extent of an AKI. It's validated for tracking CKD. Because of a nonlinear relationship between creatinine or cystatin C and GFR, those relatively small initial increases in these markers can represent a significant decrease in GFR. As such, the difference in GFR change when going from a creatinine of 0.5 to 1.0 is much more significant than a change from 3.5 to 4.0, for example. Creatinine is a product of muscle breakdown. Its levels change based on a patient's diet and muscle mass. Cystatin C can thus be a more accurate measure of GFR in patients who have a good deal of muscle mass or muscle breakdown. As a checklist, when you're admitting a patient with an AKI, of course always start with the ABCs. Think, does this patient need emergent dialysis, A-E-I-O-U, which we'll talk about later. As a chart check, look for a history of comorbidities including CHF, cirrhosis, malignancy, look for a baseline BUN to creatinine, recent med changes such as NSAIDs, ACEs and ARBs, or anticholinergics. For the HPI intake, ask them about their PO intake, any NSAID use or new meds, changes in their urinary habits including nocturia, incontinence, frequency, dysuria, retention, and straining, as well as hematuria. You can also ask them about uremia symptoms such as anorexia, nausea, or a metallic taste in their mouth. Things that you can't miss include glomerulonephritis, look for tea-colored urine, vasculitis, rashes, hemoptysis, arthritis, and a history of autoimmune disease, rhabdomyolysis as a cause of ATN, if this patient was found down, had a seizure, is endorsing muscle pain or proximal muscle weakness, AIN, ask about new meds including NSAIDs, beta-lactams, sulfa antibiotics, PPIs or allopurinol, as well as complex obstruction, which is usually due to cancer. For admission orders, always order a CBC, a BMP, a MAG, FOSS, LFTs, UA, urine sodium, urine creatinine, and urine urea. You could order CK if you're worried about rhabdomyolysis, a renal ultrasound versus a CTAP if you're concerned for obstruction, order strict eyes and O's, and hold any home ACEs, ARBs, and diuretics. Initial treatment you can consider include bolusing versus diuresing, and inserting a Foley if you're concerned about retention. Also, be sure to look for hyperkalemia and address it as necessary, including acidosis. For your assessment, starting with their history, know their baseline creatinine, whether they have CKD, any meds that they've changed, if they have an infection, sepsis, if they had a seizure, or were found down concerning for rhabdomyolysis. Clinically, look for hypo or hypertension, whether they're retaining, if they're having abdominal pain, changes in urinary habits, hematuria, or any signs of uremia, including anorexia, nausea, or metallic taste. For their exam, do a volume assessment, look for edema, trend their urine output, check for a palpable bladder, see if there's abdominal pain or any rashes to suggest AIN, see if they have dyspnea and any signs of uremia, including altered mental status, a pericardial friction rub. For data to report, ensure that you're trending the creatinine and the BUN, their bicarb, their potassium. You can consider an ABG or a VBG if you're worried about acidosis, as well as sending a urinalysis. For etiology and differential diagnosis, for your general AKI framework, think pre-renal. This includes hypotension and hypovolemia. The other causes of pre-renal physiology include a decreased effective circulating volume, secondary to mostly heart failure and cirrhosis. Meds that can also cause pre-renal physiology are NSAIDs and ACEs and ARBs. Intrinsic causes of an AKI, including actual damage to the kidney, is acute tubular necrosis caused by many things, which we'll talk about later, and rarely could be caused by crystal nephropathy, rhabdomyolysis, myeloma, or MAHA. Post-renal etiologies are usually due to BPH and malignant obstruction if it's further up in the ureters, but usually has to be bilateral. When you're thinking about your plan, you can follow up the urinalysis, the urine sodium, creatinine, and urea. For imaging, you can do a renal ultrasound versus a CTAP if there's concern for obstruction or stones, and this is mostly just to rule out hydronephrosis. If there's protein in the urine, consider a glomerular etiology. You can send things like a C3, C4, an ANCA, an anti-GBM, ANA, anti-double-strand DNA, HPV, HCV, and HIV serologies, cryoglobulin, 
SPEP, and serum-free light change. And then as a last resort, you can do a biopsy if you think it's going to change your management and if the progression of the AKI and renal failure is rapid. For the treatment, the things you should be thinking about is mostly volume. Are you going to be diuresing the patient or are you going to be giving them fluids? You should also be thinking about the need for dialysis. Again, reasons for emergent dialysis include an acidosis with a pH less than 7 despite giving bicarb, electrolytes, including refractory hyperkalemia, intoxication with ethylene glycol or methanol, overload with anuria and no ability to get the fluid out otherwise, and uremia that's causing encephalopathy or clinically significant pericarditis. Things that you should be monitoring every day include the creatinine and BUN, as well as a BMP to be looking for potassium, hyperphos, acidosis, and worsening uremia. You should hold NSAIDs, diuretics, and ACEs and ARBs. Do strict ins and outs, and if you have any concern for AIN, stop the offending agent and give PRED 40 to 60 milligrams daily for one to two weeks. If you're worried that there's a post-renal etiology, place a Foley and consider alpha antagonists like Tamsulosin if you're worried about BPH. If it's a malignant obstruction, you can consider a percutaneous nephrostomy to relieve the obstruction. Some pearls to consider. The majority of inpatient AKI is from pre-renal or ATN physiology. In general, it's okay to trial fluids, and if the AKA resolves within 48 hours, it was likely pre-renal and you don't have to go digging any further. Most AKIs are fixed with fluid, hypotension or pre-renal physiology, Lasix, mostly congestive heart failure, or a Foley due to retention. In general, it's usually easier to get fluids in a person than out of them. Yet, one liter of LR is almost always okay, and if the AKA resolves within 48 hours, then you're done. Unless, of course, the patient has end-stage renal disease, acute decompensated heart failure or cardiogenic shock, cirrhosis sinusitis or RV failure, such as due to a PE or pulmonary hypertension. If your patient has ATN, the only therapy is patience. Pre-renal AKI is caused by decreased renal perfusion and thus decreased GFR, whereas intrinsic AKI is due to direct damage to the kidneys. Prolonged pre-renal injuries can lead to an intrinsic injury via ischemia and tubular necrosis. So why do we consider the BUN to creatinine ratio, fractional excretion of sodium, and urine osms when working up AKIs? The usual ratio of BUN to creatinine, whether or not you have an AKI, is somewhere between 5 to 1 and 20 to 1. In healthy kidneys, BUN is absorbed more than creatinine. So if the intrinsic ability of the kidneys to reabsorb is lost due to some sort of damage, the BUN in your blood will be lower, and you will thus see a lower BUN to creatinine ratio less than 15 to 20. Moreover, when you have a pre-renal AKI, the kidney activates RAS, which leads to absorption of more sodium, water, and BUN, leading to a higher BUN to creatinine ratio. This is also why the fractional excretion of sodium is low, or less than 1%, the fractional excretion of urea is low, less than 35%, and the urine osm is high, usually over 500 in pre-renal physiology, because more sodium and water are reabsorbed due to wrath activation in the kidney that's able to reabsorb and concentrate the urine. However, please note that urine studies are often useless. This is because the patients need to be off diuretics and ideally have not received fluids. That being said, if the urine osms are greater than 500, it's a lot less likely to be ATN since the damaged kidneys are not able to concentrate that much. Sending a urodialysis is great for the do not miss diagnoses, including glomerulonephritis, vasculitis, rhabdomyolysis, AIN, and obstruction secondary to cancer. It won't do all of those, but the things you should be able to look out for include blood and red blood cells to look for nephritis and myoglobin in rhabdo, and protein for nephritis and lupus, and then white blood cells for acute interstitial nephritis. So why do ACEs and ARBs cause a pre-renal AKI? Well, they decrease the effective circulating volume because RAS is decreased and thus there's less sodium and water reabsorbed and can lead to lower blood pressure than the bodies become accustomed to seeing. Because of both of those things together, GFR and perfusion can be decreased. NSAIDs cause pre-renal physiology due to the afferent arterial constriction, which decreases your GFR. Crystalline nephropathy is caused by acyclovir, tumor lysis, and ethylene glycol. TTP, HUS, and MAHA can cause small vessel occlusion, which leads to intrinsic AKIs. And hypercalcemia can cause diuresis, which can lead to pre-renal physiology and AKI.
So what's the deal with ATN diuresis and polyuria? Well, ATN polyuria is due to the inability of the tubules to reabsorb after the insult. Filtering via glomeruli recovers faster than the tubular system, which reabsorbs. The GFR returns, but you can't reabsorb water from the filtrate. And this usually happens days after the insult and can last anywhere from one to three weeks. Venous injections of contrast likely do not cause true AKI and should not be cited as the primary reason to not get an otherwise needed scan in a patient. Venous injections of contrast might lead to transiently elevated creatinine, but it's very unlikely that this represents a clinically meaningful injury to the kidney. That being said, contrast from the 1950s, when a lot of the first studies were done in this area, likely was nephrotoxic. Some trials and literature that we can link off to include some of the analyses on the controversies in contrast material-induced acute kidney injury, a review on how to use serum creatinine, cystatin C, and GFR, as well as the Akiki trial, which showed in ICU patients with an AKI that they do not have better mortality if RRT, or renal replacement therapy, is started early, within six hours, versus when the patients just met certain lab or clinical criteria, such as AEIOU. Other resources that we'll link off to include the Clinical Problem Solver Schema for both AKI, intrinsic AKIs, and post-renal AKIs. There's also a really excellent lay article in EM Crit Project on contrast nephropathy, myth thereof. If you remember nothing else from this episode, remember this. The vast majority of AKIs seen inpatient are due to pre-renal etiologies, or ATN, and thus most AKIs are fixed with fluids due to hypotension, Lasix due to CHF, or a Foley due to retention. You can usually start with a bolus challenge unless the patient has obvious overload or may be difficult to get fluid out of in the case of end-stage renal disease, CHF, or cirrhosis. In general, unless profound, you can wait 48 hours to see if the AKA resolves on its own with fluids or diuresis. If it's ATN, the only therapy is patience. In general, urine studies are difficult to interpret if you've received fluids or diuretics. However, your analysis is great for picking up many but not all of the don't miss diagnoses of AKI, including glomerulonephritis, vasculitis, rhabdomyolysis, AIN, and obstruction secondary to cancer. Acute renal failure will rarely require dialysis, but if it does, remember the indications AEIOU. Acidosis with a pH less than 7 despite giving bicarb, electrolytes with refractory hyperkalemia, intoxication with ethylene glycol or methanol, overload with anuria, uremia causing encephalopathy or clinically significant pericarditis. That's all for this episode. Check out pointofcaremedicine.com to see the templates we discussed, as well as the pearls, literature, and links to other resources.